So look at that title, will you? Still sinful, still saved. I just wanted to play with the minds of the people that were driving by. You know, what do you mean? They can't say that, that's not right. Wait a minute, I got to think about that. Still sinful, still saved. Textual lesson tonight, please take out your Bibles and open them to Romans chapter six. And if the Lord is willing, we'll have a nice old fashioned Bible study from Romans chapter six through chapter seven. I believe that the title describes perfectly the unique experience of every Christian who continues to struggle with sin, even while he knows, he or she knows, that God has redeemed him from the sin that he struggles with each day. It's so confusing and so <sighs> aggravating. So Paul explains the seeming paradox in these two ch chapters in Romans and I would like to outline his presentation of these ideas in this lesson. So let's start with the saved part because that's what he talks about first in Romans six, still saved. So the verse from which most of these two chapters flow is verse five of chapter six. And in it, Paul summarizes the point that he's going to explain at length. And he does this a lot. He summarizes an idea and then he explains it at length. And so this is what he does. Chapter six, verse five, he says, for if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly, 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 no doubt, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That's the summary statement. Now he's going to unpack this in the verses to come. Simply stated here in this verse, if we share his death, Paul says, we will share his life. The verse puts forth this idea in a, a propositional form. It says, if we are united in the likeness of his death, then we will be in the likeness of his life. Now there've been many scholars who have tried to marginalize or mysticize this passage to make it mean that we somehow symbolically die and somehow we symbolically live. Uh, but for those who struggle with sin and death, this symbolism is not very comforting. If I'm on the edge of death, I don't want symbols. I want reality. I want certainly. I want certainty not just symbolism. So Jesus' death and his resurrection and life were real. There weren't, he didn't come here symbolically, he actually came, it's historical, right? Paul tells his readers that those who experience Jesus' death and life experience no mere symbol. They experience the true death and the true life of Christ. Otherwise, our religion is no more than just ceremony and tradition and religious exercise and, and, uh, and symbolism. And some people are happy with that. They're happy with that. Symbols, ceremony, shh, give me lots of it and make it as fancy as you can because I like ceremony and I like symbolism but I don't know about you, and I want more than ceremony and symbolism in my religion. So in the verses surrounding this particular one, Paul explains the death and the life that we share in Christ Jesus. And he begins with the death. 
In verse uh, chapter six, one and two, he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin, there's the death, still live in it? So he begins by responding to a question that one might ask concerning what he has said in chapters four and five. Someone might ask, well, if we're saved by grace through faith, what stops me from sinning, knowing that grace abounds for sinners? In other words, God's, God's grace is covering my sin all the time. Why shouldn't I just go out and sin? Because there's plenty of grace to cover. As a matter of fact, for every sin I have, God has more grace, can't lose. And so Paul's answer is that for those who have accepted grace, Sin is no longer an appealing option. That's the, that's the thing. Only someone who has not experienced the grace of God would bother to ask a question like that. In answering the question, however, he opens up a new page of thought by introducing the idea of our own death to sin. He's already explained how Christ died for our sins. Now he's going to show how we die to sin. And so we go to Romans chapter six, verse three and four. He says, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? So how do we experience his death? Well, he says it right here. All those who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. No need for me to go to a cross somewhere. No need for me to say, Marty, on Monday you'll crucify me up and then on Tuesday or Wednesday I'll crucify you up so that we will know the death of Jesus. Because Paul explains, when you are baptized, you are experiencing the death of Jesus. Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So we share experience and become united in the likeness of Jesus Christ's death through baptism. This is a metaphorical concept that describes a true experience. Jesus' death is real, it's physical, it's historical. However, it's spiritual, meaning its unseen, immaterial, supernatural purpose was to pay for our moral debt of sin. So think for a moment. You have a physical thing, the death of Jesus on the cross. That's a physical thing. You have a physical thing accomplishing a very real and tangible but unseen thing, which is forgiveness of sins. Can you see forgiveness? Can you see it? Can you touch forgiveness? Of course not. We know it's a very real thing, but it's an intangible thing. And so forgiveness of, thing, uh, of sin is the intangible but unseen thing that we receive from Jesus Christ. Well, in the same way, a Christian's baptism is real, it's physical, it's historical, but its spiritual and very tangible purpose is threefold. Number one, it causes us to share metamorphically his death. In other words, I share the death of Christ through baptism. Why, why is it this way? Because God has made it this way, that's why. Two, it unites us to him spiritually. Well, how does that work that unites us to him spiritually? Well, because God made it that way, that's why. And three, it causes us to experience his life, a physical thing through which we experience spiritual things. 
Why is it this way? Because God has made it this way, that's why. And so in verses one to four, Paul explains how we share in his death, and that is through the act of baptism. And in verse five, he continues to explain that this union also permits us another experience, and that is his resurrection and his life. And in verses six to 23, he describes the details of this life. First of all, he talks about the why, why we live. He says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, again, how did we do that through baptism? We believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. If you can believe that a metaphorical thing like baptism brings about an unseen but tangible thing like uh, uh, forgiveness, well then you can also understand that being united to Christ through baptism, right, also brings a tangible thing, which is what? Which is life, the life that Jesus Christ has. In a word, we live because of the resurrection. Our old life of sin has died and it's been buried with Christ in baptism. Now we have a new life and that new life is tied to the resurrected life of Jesus. There's no, there's no going back. Uh, there's no resurrection of the old man of sin because as surely as Christ has been raised from the dead, we also have been raised from the grave of baptism to a new life. We know that old ways die hard. Uh, there's much evidence to suggest that nothing has changed, but we are resurrected as surely as Christ is resurrected. It's a sure thing. Then he talks about how we live, why we live. We live because we've been resurrected with Christ. That's why, no other way to do that. Now he's going to talk about how we live. Verses 12 to 14, he says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts and do not go on at presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. That's what you used to do. Don't do that anymore. That's your old life. You buried that life. That life is dead. Now, he says, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. Here I am, Lord, I'm alive. And so uh, alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God for sin shall not be master over you for you are not under law, but you are uh, under grace. So if we are resurrected, if we have this new life, how will we survive in this sinful body? Paul tells his readers that in baptism, a very real and important change has taken place, but his readers see the same sinful flesh before them. How will they live this resurrected life that Paul is talking about while they're still in this sinful body? His answer. His answer is the law no longer is the active ingredient in your spiritual lives. Grace is now what empowers them. While they were sinners without Christ, the only spiritual source of power working in their lives was the law. And its only purpose was to convict them of sin. The new life, has introduced a new spiritual power, and that is the power of grace. While under the influence of grace, 
they will now be able to overcome sin in their lives and despite their failures, they will be acceptable to God. The new life is possible and is essentially different than the old life because it is powered by God's grace and not the law. So what then is the substance of our new life? I know what the substance of my old life was, you know, sin and death, but what's the substance of my new life? Well, the first thing is righteousness. Righteousness is the substance of your new life. The substance of life lived under the power of the law had two elements, sin and death. The substance of the life lived under the power of grace also has two elements. One of them is righteousness. Paul describes this in chapter 6, 15. He says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I pause here simply to say that you are slaves of one or the other. You're either a slave of sin or you're a slave of righteousness. There's no in between. There's no, well, I'd rather not choose. No, no. Because if you're not a slave of righteousness in Christ, then you're a slave of sin, except you may not be aware of that. But that's the reality of your life. So he says, just as you presented your members as slaves for impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in uh, sanctification. So grace enables us to express our righteousness in two ways. First, it empowers us to overcome sin, which changes our physical lives and helps us to provide a witness to unbelievers. In other words, we become Christians, we become better people, we become righteous people. We become people who are thirsty and hungry for righteousness. And that appeals to other people. It's not just demonstrating to other people that we do good works, which is a good thing in itself, but it's also them seeing in us the hunger and thirst to do what is right, to do God's will, to know what Jesus Christ wants from us and with all of our heart and strength to want to do that. When somebody observes you, you know, being like that day in and day out, that has an impact on them. Uh, they're saying to themselves, there must be something going on in that person's life because they want different things. They hope for and thirst for uh, things that they didn't uh, uh, before. And then grace also uh, provides confidence for salvation in that God offers us Christ's perfect righteousness as our shield against the law. Grace improves our physical lives and it guarantees our righteousness before God, which enriches our spiritual lives as well. And then we have eternal life. Remember I said there were uh, 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 the substance of our new life, one is righteousness, the other one is eternal life. Paul says the following about this. He says, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard of righteous, to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. The old life of sin resulted in shame, condemnation and death. The new life leads to righteousness. It leads to eternal life. Eternal life is not simply a, a, a never ending life, but also a life that has a certain quality as well. Although Paul does not describe it here, eternal living is living with God, is living in joy, is living with peace and love, is living with never ending sinlessness. I think it's the thing that I desire and look forward to the most in going to heaven. I hear people say, boy, when I get to heaven, I'm so anxious to ask Moses, you know, what was, what was with your brother building that stupid calf, you know, and let, get Moses to give me the scoop. You know, I don't care. I, I don't care what got into uh, Aaron. I, I, I don't care about that. I want to live and exist where there is no sin. And I don't just mean no sin in me, it's sin in you, because you're tired of me because of the sin in me. And I get tired of you for the very same reason. And I want to be in a place where there is no sin in me or in you. Uh, there's no hint of sin, no threat of sin, no danger of sin. It will never appear again. And this is, this is what Paul is talking about, one of the qualities of uh, eternal life. And so with this new life with Christ is not simply a theological principle for Paul. It's, it's a tangible, discernible experience. And he describes the experience of that new life as A, something that is real and seen as the resurrection of Christ is real and seen and something that is visible not only in the righteous living it produces in the ones who possess it, but the confidence that these people have in facing death. So we're saved and we will go to heaven and we will live eternally. And the mark of that here on earth is our thirst for righteousness and our confidence before facing death. Everybody's afraid of death because nobody wants to suffer pain. But once we push through that door, there will be no pain ever again. All right, so let's talk about, that's the saved part. Now let's talk about the struggling part. Remember, still saved, still struggling. The case is fully stated in chapter six. In baptism, we die with Christ and we re resurrect to a new life in Christ that is tangible and real. Chapter seven goes on to explain the conflict that develops as this new life emerges from the confines of a sinful flesh. There's long been a debate whether Paul is speaking of his former life here or if he's describing his present life as a Christian. There are sincere arguments for both sides. However, I believe that Paul is speaking of his present life. He's talking about what he's going through now. And I believe this for two reasons. First, the entire section deals with the new life that one experiences upon being buried with Christ in baptism. And Paul is continuing his description of this new life. You know, chapter six, that was the upside of the new life, freedom from fear and death and, and, and power in the Holy Spirit. Uh, he experiences this when the duality of man's nature collides, you know, the new man uh, with all of these wonderful things collides with the old man of flesh who's still there. And so in chapter seven, he's going to describe the kind of the downside of this new life. In verse 25, he summarizes the entire chapter in the present tense, suggesting that the experience he describes in chapter seven is one that he is undergoing presently. So in chapter seven, Paul tells the Romans, we are saved and salvation is real and you can see it in your lives. However, 
while you are in the flesh, you will still struggle with sin. Chapter seven describes this struggle in his own life. And then in chapter eight, he'll offer a solution to the problem. But the essential problem that Christians face, which Paul explains here, is that in becoming united to Christ and having a new life, we're no longer subject to the law in judgment, but we are still influenced by the law in effect. In other words, the law no longer condemns us before God, but it still has the power to affect our lives here on earth. And this idea being free from the law, Paul explains in chapter seven. You'll read with me, he says, or do you not know brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person for as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning her husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Here, Paul uses the analogy of marriage. The passage is not about marriage necessarily, but he uses the analogy of marriage to show that the law has limits. The law governed marriage until one of the partners died, after which the person was beyond the law, not beyond God, but simply beyond the law. In the same way, he says, if a person died with Christ in baptism, they were beyond the law, not beyond God, but they were beyond the law. Those in Christ have another power source in their life. Grace is the power source, not the law. So we continue reading verse seven. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and uh, I died. In verses seven to 12, the apostle reassures his readers that just because one is beyond the law doesn't mean that the law has failed or the law is in some way imperfect. On the contrary, he says, the law has done its job. It's convicted Paul of sin and made him aware that he was condemned. This is the essential purpose of the law in its relationship to man, to convict and to condemn and ultimately lead one to Christ for forgiveness and salvation. And in doing its job, the law remains perfectly suited, perfectly suited to what it was created for. It is perfect. It is holy, it is without fault. So in the final section, Paul will describe the nature of the struggle that takes place within himself as a saved spirit dwelling inside a sinful flesh that is not judged by the law anymore, but affected by it. That's why Christians sometimes feel guilty. So let's read that. He says, therefore, did that which is good become the cause of death for me? Meaning the law? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good. So that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. Well, first of all, there's another rhetorical question which asks, how can something good and holy, the law, 
how can something good and holy cause death? Paul answers that it is sin that causes death. The law merely exposes sin by holding it up uh, to the light of perfection and condemns it by revealing God's response to sin. You know, the, the, the law does not cause the suffering and death experienced by the flesh. The law is a diagnostic tool used by God to show us what does cause life's misery, and that is sin. I give you an example. An x-ray does not cause or cure cancer. It only reveals the cancer that you suffer from. And when it's revealed, uh, there's even more anguish and suffering because now you know what you have and you're afraid. The law works in the same way. It reveals what you have. And once you see what you have, what sin you have, it makes you sad, it makes you afraid, it makes you nervous, it makes you fear the judgment that will, that will uh, come. And so in seven, verses 14 to 17, he says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. And so Paul explains the struggle from a personal perspective. He notes several things about his struggle. First, the essential reason for the struggle is that a regenerated spirit dwells in a sinful shell of a man or a woman. That's the problem. Number two, the regenerated spirit recognizes and desires to practice the law, but the sinful flesh undermines any attempt to do so. The spirit says, I'm going to do this good thing, or I'm going to stop doing this bad thing. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do because that's going to please the Lord. And the flesh says, oh, no, you're not. Over my dead body, you're going to do that. And so the, the struggle you know, begins and it continues. And then thirdly, what makes the struggle so painful is that a Christian is aware of this dichotomy at all times. At all times, a Christian is aware that this struggle continues within him or her. When he says, Paul, when he says that he is no longer the one doing it, Paul does not reject personal responsibility for his sins because of his struggle. He means that when he sins, he has failed to do what he really wants to do, which is obey God's law. Sin is a victory of his flesh, but not his spirit. It is still his flesh, however, that he has to deal with. So we read from uh, verse 18 to uh, 23. He says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Imagine, this is the apostle speaking. He's talking about his present life condition. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am going to do the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. And so in these verses, Paul describes the outcome of his struggle between the regenerated spirit and the flesh. He sees clearly the desire of his regenerated spirit to do God's perfect and holy will. And also 
he sees clearly his sinful flesh's unwillingness to respond. The struggle brings to light the opposite forces in his nature. He also sees clearly which of the two has the preeminent position. It is his inner man, he says, his spirit, his regenerated self that wills, that recognizes, that delights, that desires to do God's will. The flesh, the flesh is a pawn, the flesh is a force, the flesh is a resistor that frustrates these desires, but it is not the dominant force in the Christian's life. He concedes that this struggle will continue throughout his lifetime. That's why he says he's a prisoner of it and he must accept the situation. The final verses summarize what he has explained in the last couple of verses. He says, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this, of this death? And so this is an impossible situation, a wretched one to be continually denied the desire of the inner man by the sinful influence of the flesh. The body of death is sinful flesh that will not allow a complete union and harmony between the regenerated spirit and God. It's as if our whole Christian life were hungering and we're thirsty for God to be with him, to have nothing interfere in our relationship with him. And always the flesh interferes, always the flesh, you know, takes the edge off of anything good or pure that we want to accomplish in the name of the Lord. And Paul is saying, he calls it what it is. It's wretchedness, spiritual wretchedness. You can be as rich as you want. And if you have this struggle going on inside of you, it spoils everything else. So what's the solution, he says? Well, in verse 25, he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, so then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. And so the solution is twofold. Jesus Christ, he just mentions him. Paul does not explain all that Christ does to help us. He simply says that the solution is in Christ. And if you were to follow, we're not going to do that, but if you were to follow in chapter eight, he's going to describe how God helps this wretched man deal with this struggle. And of course, it's by giving him the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works inside the Christian and also the promise of, um, of uh, resurrection and, and the guarantee uh, God makes to man that he will never abandon him, that nothing will come uh, between them, despite the struggle uh, that is going on. So that's the first solution, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. I came here this morning, I was sitting like you, all of you, uh, uh, with all of the good and bad that uh, takes place inside of a person's body. And of course, you know, uh, the words of the prayers and the words of the preacher are good, but the thing that uh, lifted me the most uh, was the singing, uh, the singing, and no offense, you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying. Uh, the singing was just uh, heavenly, uh, to hear the women, the sisters' voices rise above, uh, it was heavenly. Uh, it, it lifted me uh, in a way that no physical thing or no um, medicine, uh, could lift. Uh, there are spiritual things that go on at the worship service that those who don't avail themselves of our services miss, that they lose forever. They never have the chance to uh, experience. And so the first solution is Jesus Christ. And then the second, I need to move on, I know, is acceptance. The struggle is painful and it's frustrating, but it is easier to bear once it is accepted for what it is. I know what's going on. I know my spirit is still in charge. I know one day I'll be free. So Paul explains simply that as a regenerated man, he serves God honestly and sincerely with his spirit. And when he sins, the flesh is responsible. 
This is not to absolve him of responsibility, but rather to confirm the existence of both entities and which one influences his obedience and which his disobedience. And so to summarize, from this then are several lessons we can draw from these two chapters that can be applied to our own lives. I leave you with the lessons uh, and the sermon is yours. Lesson number one, this is every Christian's struggle. Do not think that Paul was unique or that his struggle was more intense than the average Christian today. What he describes is the normal struggle that each one of us experiences as we try our best to serve Jesus Christ our Lord. And we see over and over again how short we fall at times. It's not an excuse to be lukewarm, but it does help us to understand why even knowing and wanting to do our best for Christ does not always guarantee the results that we desire. The flesh also has a say. We wish it didn't. We wish we could choke it down so that there was never a peep from our flesh, but we can't do that. The flesh has its say. And number two, the struggle is a sign of life. Do not be discouraged if what you see in Christ is not always what you accomplish in Christ. The fact that you see, the fact that you desire, the fact that you hurt is the proof that Christ is in you and that you are truly a regenerated person. You see, the unregenerated man whether he is an unbeliever or calls himself a Christian, is always the easiest one to spot. He has no struggle. He has no struggle. And then one more, God will provide. Although he only mentions it briefly in chapter seven, Paul knew that God would and did provide for his struggle. He provides help and encouragement in this life so that we do not lose hope or desire for the next life. He provides a promise of eternal life so that we know that one day the struggle will end and it will be over forever. So be happy and rejoice in your struggle, brethren, knowing that it is a sign and a promise of your salvation now and to come in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so I invite you, if you need help to be saved, as we say, or as Paul says, you're united and you relive the, 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 the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in baptism. I think we read it in black and white. If you haven't done that, then you have not been buried and raised again with Christ. So if we can help you with that matter in your life, and we encourage you to come forward and let yourself uh, you know, confess the name of Christ and become a Christian. Or if the struggle that I'm talking about has become difficult, uh, if you feel overwhelmed, that's what elders are for. That's what the church is for in order to sustain and, and, and strengthen each other for the struggle uh, to uh, be able to uh, maintain that without being discouraged. Maintain it without uh, giving up. And so if you need prayer to help with your own personal struggle, whatever it may be, then we also encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement. Shall we do that please? <laughs> 